I think that it's about time that our community who's been in this country for over 100 years has an Arab American Muslim congresswoman. I am uh, working and doing my best to spread the knowledge and the faith that I have. I, I thought through comedy we can build alliances with other communities, which is really important for us as Arab Americans. There's too few of us in this country, I think, to make a difference politically. Major funding for Arab American Stories was provided by Mohammed and Jamie El Arian, the Arab American Community of Michigan, the Arab American Community of Houston, Texas, the American Syrian Arab Cultural Association of Michigan. Additional funding was provided by community is at the heart of American life. Social services provider and activist Linda Sarsour serves new immigrants and youth in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Imam Taha Tawil maintains spiritual vitality at the oldest mosque in America, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Dino Badala performs across the country with a group of comedians who shatter popular myths and stereotypes. Linda Sarsour represents a new generation of Arab Americans dedicated to service. Her fierce Brooklyn spirit drives her leadership both locally and on the national stage. My name is Linda Sarsour. Um, I'm the director at the Arab American Association of New York. I am born and raised in Brooklyn. I'm a social worker, an activist, um, and a mom. Arab American, how may I help you? Alaikum salam. Ahla sahla. Okay, so into you to kabil uspoayin, you want to send your children to the Okay, if you come to us on two days, and I'm going to talk to you with someone who works with us in the My favorite thing about the work that I do is when a woman comes to our organization in a domestic violence situation, and we help her make her safe, and we help her access public benefits, and we make her feel like she has more opportunities and get her into a job training program, and she comes back to us two years later, and she's a donor. Or when a Yemeni woman who had no formal education in her home country comes to our program, learns English, and comes back with her citizenship certificate and a big plate of sabaya, which is a very special Yemeni sweet that they make. And that just brings like joy to my heart. How many people wish that we lived in a world where it was okay to be who we are? And everyone on TV thought we were the coolest thing. How many people wish we lived in a world like that? <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't live in a world like that. And that brings me to why you guys are here today. In order for us not to live in a world like that, we need every single one of you, see I'm looking at all of you, to be a part of this. And the reason why the Jamaica is here, the reason why you guys are here is because we need young people. I mean, what started me off 10 years ago was a family relative who had just opened the Arab American Association of New York, which was supposed to be a kind of social service agency helping people out. And obviously the, the idea behind the Arab American Association came before 9-11. When 9-11 happened, it was like the whole course of what that organization was going to be changed. I saw grown men from New York um, who were going to register under a program called NSEERS, where they asked for all males over the age of 16 to register with immigration. And I remember, you know, interpreting for people at the windows. And then I started noticing that there were some that were going to the 10th floor. So I went up to an officer. I said, where are these men going? And they said, they're going to the FBI. And I started taking down people's names um, and taking down phone numbers of their loved ones because I didn't know if they were coming back. I mean, working on these cases for the past 10 years in my organization, it's kind of a lot to go home with at night. Like you think about these families um, and then thinking about women whose husbands are in detention centers that are disgusting and unsanitary, going there and not finding their husband there, they were moved to another facility. I mean, it's just, it's just a lot to hold. Emotionally burdens you kind of to feel like your people are doing uh, are going through this and there's really not much that you can do but to make sure that their stories are being told.
We're in a country where our Congress doesn't represent the people. I don't see people that look like me or have the same priorities that communities of color have. And I think that it's about time that our community who's been in this country for over 100 years has an Arab American Muslim Congresswoman. So I'm hoping to start small, start in the city council um, and work my way up. Brooklyn is such a wonderful place and, not, and people always say Brooklyn has someone from everywhere but it also has Arabs from everywhere. We're all one community. I don't see divisions like, oh, you're Syrian and this one's Egyptian. It's just such a beautiful place to live. My parents moved here to Sunset Park, Brooklyn in the late 70s. My family is originally from the West Bank, from a town called El Bire. Uh, I have six siblings. I'm the oldest child. Growing up in a very traditional Palestinian family, and my parents thought it was the right thing to do that when I was 17 years old and graduating high school a year early, that I was ready for marriage. In our community, you don't say really no to your parents because your parents love you and I'm sure they want the best for you. So I got married at the age of 17. I had three children by the time I was 24 years old. I would never do an arranged marriage for my children. They marry who they love. I'm teaching them all the values that they need to have. Um, I obviously would love for my children to marry, you know, Arabs and Muslims, but they are free to do what they want. I think it's important that we keep an open mind um, and that we invite people who aren't just Arabs, like other people of different ethnicities. And that we continue to push ourselves to establish connections with people that may not be the same as us, who may not believe in the same things as us. So I'm 31 years old and in the Arab American community the next activist is about 57. So there's a 25 year gap between activists now and those elders and we thought it was important to start a program where we train kids to be community organizers. We train them to identify their own issues, whether it's in their school, in their mosque, or in their church, or wherever it is that they feel is their community. We teach the kids to be facilitators of their own groups, just to make sure that they feel empowered and feel like this is their own project and their own initiative. I want to thank every one of you guys for attending our event. Linda is an inspiration. She's there to motivate us all the time, and she's just always there by our side to help us. It's just been one wonderful experience for me. They are young women and young men, fearless. Um, I think that that's such an inspiration to their families and to our community because we do have people in our community who are afraid and who don't want to speak up. We're just building a pipeline of, of future leaders. Now here's the second layout we have in mind. We must vote on one of the themes that the website provides. Our newspaper is called The Amplifier, which is possibly the first youth newspaper out in New York so we're really excited and we're just getting a whole bunch of youth to write and it's just amazing because we're able to make an outreach as well as tell our stories and our perspective and our opinions are going to be heard. I'm excited about putting my point of view out there. It's, it's a means of you know connecting with the younger generation. A lot of times when you're young you think that you don't have a voice and Linda always says you are the future and she says it constantly. The youth have they have power. Whenever something important is happening, she doesn't go to the adults, she comes to the youth. I'm, I'm hoping that what I'm doing is creating a legacy and opening an opportunity for other young people to do the work that I'm doing right now. Yeah, where you exactly. can have this and then like this on the side of the video section. So I mean, I always grew up with the energy that I have. Um, obviously now I'm focusing in, in a certain area, but my family gives me inspiration. I sometimes sit back and say, why am I doing this? What am I doing to myself? I could just go work in corporate America and have a nine to five job. But I think about what kind of world do I want to leave for my children. And I also feel like being Palestinian, I think that's a special energy that we have. It's about something that connects us to something much larger than we are. I feel like if you're not passionate about something, you don't have a drive for it. And I think the original passion that I had and the one that I continue to have is Palestine. And I think that's what drives me the most. Imam Taha Tawil leads the oldest mosque in America. As the Arab American founders prospered and moved to the suburbs, he finds himself with a diverse congregation that shares his pride in the mother mosque's history. Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. Ahlan wa sahlan, welcome. My name is Taha Tawil. I am from Jerusalem and I came to United States way back in 1983. And uh, we are in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and the Mother Mosque of America. This mosque is the first mosque to be built from the ground up. It started in the early 30s, where the community put their efforts with a big celebration on February 15, 1934.
I want you to know that this mask represents uh, the identity and the dignity of the Muslims which serve this country for generation and generation. And I see that the problem is not Islamic or Christian or Jewish. It's a human. It's, it's just uh, a human nature from Noah to Abraham, to Moses, to Jesus, to Muhammad, the mission of the prophets is to build a human being, to build them well-balanced and well uh, character and well uh, personality. We Muslims in America live in peace and harmony. We are, uh, in September 11, we have double jeopardy. First, we have Muslims and Arabs killed in that uh, attack. Number two, we are Americans like the others, and we also have the pain, and we cannot be blamed for it. We are part of, of the community. So thank God the people know this, most of them. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Please, Allah, make this gathering a gathering of compassion, a gathering of peace, and a gathering of understanding. Oh Allah, we thank you for this moment that you allow us to gather and to share knowledge with each other and to understand our way of life. Thank you, Allah, for all the prophets and the messengers that you sent to us to be leaders and to show us the way, the truth and the light. At the Mother Mosque during September 11, I did find some flowers on the steps of the mosque. I did have many messages on the answering machine uh, saying, we know that you are not part of this group. You are Americans and we love you and we know that this is, cannot be from people who live among us. This mosque is over a hundred years, the community in Iowa. People are civilized here, sophisticated. They know what is right and what is wrong. And any terrorism is wrong, and any human blood is shed is wrong. This is against the teaching of God. Welcome, w welcome, welcome, Sarah. Oh, thank this you. This is in Urdu. Correct. And Arabic. Arabic and Urdu. Right. I think especially because of 9-11, we have a preconceived idea that is, um, and because of the tragedy that occurred there, um, it's a challenge. And I think as um, more people really learn and understand, we're all human beings. Whereas we became close to the teacher, in order to become closer to the Prophet Muhammad, in order to become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, and like in Surah Al-Khaf, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, it gives you a, 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 a righteous guide. And so in one of the verses, in the early verses, Allah gives you a righteous guide. And that's how I look at the email. But it's more intimate because like I told you earlier, he said he, he, teach, he taught us the same way that he taught his children. And so that's a very intimate relationship. And the, it's like a weave been woven, and, and the bond is Islam. And that's my relationship with the email talk. Sometimes, you know, I look back over the years and, and uh, look at the advantage of, of, of having a relationship with them. And if at the time you don't notice that you're picking up the knowledge, it's like water. One thing, one thing the man did say one time is that if you had a drop of water that continuously fell on a, a, a boulder, the water would split the boulder. And this is how the relationship has been. He's instilled a lot into me, uh, I think into all of us, and it, 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 it reflects in our lifestyle now. But at the time, you don't even notice it. it it's not until you go up, get a little older and wise, and then you can look back at it and, and, and be like, man, I was really privileged. That's how I, that's that's my relationship with the man. I feel privileged to uh, have him as a, a a teacher and a friend. I am uh, working and doing my best to spread the knowledge and uh, the faith that I have 
and no one is objecting or no one is st stopping me from doing that. And as a chaplain, I, I am a chaplain in the police department. I am also a chaplain in corrections. I go visit corrections and I do breach there and help others, whether they are Muslim, Christian, Jews, whoever is in my way, I will uh, help him to connect to God and to see uh, how God is great and he go on his own way. I don't force anybody, I just explain. As they say in America, you can bring the horse to the water, but you cannot make it drink. And that's basically what I value the best in America is my freedom, my humanity, and the dream that I have has been fulfilled. Dean Obadallah is on a mission to dismantle the stereotype of the scary Muslim with humor and positive, highly entertaining interaction with his audiences. A Muslim comic is an oxymoron because there's no laughter in Islam. This tour is part of a broader agenda of Islam to make Americans think that Muslims are like any other American. But they're not. Actually, they are soldiers of Allah. That's what they say. My last name is Obidallah. I am the servant of Allah. So maybe I am the soldier of Allah as well. I just hope you never feel self-conscious or uncomfortable in your own country at any time. It's a true, I'm paying on a credit card, true story. Guy behind the counter picked up my credit card, sees the Allah part, looks at me all oh, weird. He's like, hey, buddy. What kind of name is uh, uh, that? Hi, my name is Dean Obadala. I'm an Arab-American comedian. I, I live here in New York City. It's an Arabic name. He goes, what, what does this mean? So I'm like, well, we'll translate it to English. It means peaceful, friendly Arab. <laughs> Tonight, I'm producing the Big Brown Christmas Show at the Broadway Comedy Club on 53rd Street and 8th Avenue in, in Midtown Manhattan. Hey, how are you? Okay, so not open. Probably ten minutes. There's really no religious connotation to it. It's just called a Christmas show because it's two weeks before Christmas. We don't care if you're Muslim, if you're, you know, Jewish, if you're Buddhist, if you're Christian, uh, whatever your background is. If you're brown, tonight's a, a holiday party for all of us without any religious connotations whatsoever to it. I've usually produced things that are just Arab-centric. The Arab American Comedy Festival. I co-produced that with my friend Nasun Zayed here in New York for the last eight years or I did Arabs Gone Wild tour, but I wanted to do something that's more inclusive and beyond just Arab. So this one's brown, so we include anyone who's brown, Arab and Indian and Pakistani, Afghani, Iranian, everyone, we put them all in together and it, it adds more diversity to the comedy. I, I thought through comedy we can build alliances with other communities, which is really important for us as Arab Americans. There's too few of us in this country I think to make a difference politically, we need to build alliances and have a coalition of other people with similar backgrounds, similar interests. My dad's Palestinian Muslim, my mom's Italian and Catholic. Uh, we were raised with both faiths growing up in our house. It was culturally, Islam was a big part because we had no, no pork or alcohol in the house. That was a big thing because of my father being Muslim. And, you know, he taught me Muslim prayers, but my father didn't go to the mosque. He wasn't the most religious person, but he was certainly in touch with his faith and it was important to him. You know, I didn't really connect with my heritage, my Arab heritage as much, until 9-11. And the seeds for whatever I am today were planted pre-9-11, but they didn't grow into what I am now and what I'm doing and what motivates me until after 9-11, until I saw the backlash against Arab Americans and Muslim Americans in this country. Right there, 155. We're going to the edit room for the documentary I'm co-producing called The Muslims Are Coming, about our tour in the South and the West, doing all free shows with Muslim American comedians and trying to reach out to non-Muslims through comedy. Sixth floor, that's where in a little wee sublet space from a bigger regular office. We're just there in the back, editing, long hours. All the touring is done, and that's essentially what the structure of the movie is, what's up on the wall, but keeps evolving. We're gonna go to places where I think that they've never met a Muslim American before. And all they know about is what they saw on TV, which basically is not good, let's be honest. We met a lot of great people. Most people open-minded in America, most people are not walking around going, I hate Muslims. What we really found out, people did have questions about Islam. They had sincere questions, and we did our best to answer them. 
This is sort of the natural outgrowth of just trying to use comedy as a form of activism, frankly. It's just not going away. In fact, polls would indicate that it's actually getting worse in America, that more Americans now have problems with Muslims and view them more suspiciously or less American than they did right after 9-11. You know, Muslim and Arab mean the same thing to most Americans. So when you see negative comments about Muslims, doesn't matter if you're Arab Christian or Arab Jewish, if you're Arab, people think you're all the same. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a struggle not just for Muslims, it's a struggle for, I think, anyone who could be, be perceived as Muslim, any Arab person, any brown person, frankly. Comedy is the connector. Comedy is the thing that makes you laugh and want to come see the movie. And while you're getting that sugar of comedy, perhaps you're going to learn some stuff. That's our dream. And that's the movie, right there. Apparently now we're on the radar of the leading Islamophobe, one of the five leading people on their website, Robert Spencer, has a website called Jihad Watch. So he wrote an article saying essentially that our tour is, we're being used as tools by the Muslim Brotherhood. Unwitting, we don't know it. He's saying he's trying to inform us of the fact that because we're trying to show Americans that you don't have to be afraid of Muslims, it's part of the Muslim Brotherhood's infiltration plan. But if they, we were working for the Muslim Brotherhood, you would think they would pay us at least to finance, finish this film, but they're not. It is another column somebody wrote about me here. They call me the Dean of Comedy, Stealth Jihad. That I have a stealth jihad in the form of entertainment to take over America. I didn't like being a lawyer at all. I did litigation. I didn't find it fulfilling. There was a funniest lawyer competition that the Bar Association New Jersey had sponsored. And then I just started going to more open mics. All I know it was a blur. I mean, you get on stage and there's all these people in front of you and you tell some jokes and they laugh at some and they don't laugh at others. It was fun. We have a great show. Welcome to the Big Brown Christmas Show. We have some some great brown comics. Oh, this is for you to uh, okay, keep. Awesome, awesome. And we'll, you know we, we can do the timing together, or whatever. Okay, to worry great. about the timing. It's a little red light over here, and the comics are all somewhat professional about okay. time and everything. And it should be a good crowd. I don't think it'll be sold out. But I think it'll be really close to sold out. Well, there's a line upstairs. There's always a line upstairs yeah. because all the brown people show yeah, up at yeah. 8:15 for an 8 o'clock show. Sure. Comics tend to be social and then there's a point where they become really morose and you know very depressed and angry and bitter but at this level most of these comics are are happy still because they think they might have a career <laughs> but I'm doing it long enough where I've come to terms with the fact that I won't have a career this is all I have no you you find your way in this business whatever it might be next to me comes the stage one of the producers of the show uh, you've seen him on t TV you've seen him on a uh, Comedy Central's Access of Evil Comedy Tour, CNN Muslims Are Coming Tour, all over. Give it up for Dean Abidal, everyone. Give it up for Dean. Yeah, nice, bro. Nice. Have a nice round of applause for Gibran. Come on. Of all the brown people you saw. Can you believe how many brown comics there are now? It's something like, like there's three of us now. Everywhere. I know I look white to the people who don't know me. I'm actually. Inside, very, very brown. I'm very, very brown. There'll be Arab American comics who will reach mainstream and already have on some level. No one's a big star yet, but getting increasingly on television. But I think the challenge is not just talking about Arab issues. If you're just talking about being Arab American or your father has an accent, or your mother has an accent, or the weird food you brought to lunch to school when you were younger, it's very limited the audience you're going to appeal to. Issue to me is you're not reaching out beyond our community and telling them who we are. So your comedy has to be one that's accessible to mainstream audiences, not just Arab American audiences. <laughs> you're conditioned to be afraid. Like you're alone on the street, you're a white guy, four black men dressed up like Barack Obama woke up, you're not nervous. Four black men woke up dressed like G-Unit, maybe you're scared a little bit. <laughs> We're all conditioned. You see an old Asian woman walking on the street, you don't care. You see an old Asian woman driving the car next to you, you might get nervous. <laughs> And for the non-Arabs here, you see four Arab guys in a deli in New York, you don't care. You see four Arab guys about to board your flight speaking Arabic to each other. <laughs> and then one of the black guy used to be afraid of her protection. <laughs> Shizzle my nizzle, it might be a terrorism. I am Neda Ulavi. Hope to see you next week for more Arab American stories. Major funding for Arab American stories was provided by Mohammed and Jamie El Arian, the Arab American Community of Michigan, the Arab American Community of Houston, Texas, the American Syrian Arab Cultural Association of Michigan. Additional funding was provided by 